Okay, welcome back for this afternoon session. We, our first speaker is uh, Frank Uriker from Dresden, who's going to tell us about uh, chemically active droplets. Yeah, thank you, Christina. It's a great pleasure to participate at this um, meeting in honor of SRIRAM. Um, it's great to be back here in Bangalore. And um, I'd like to thank the organizers um, for the invitation. It's wonderful to see so many old friends and new friends, exciting science. Um, the work I'm going to present today um, is motivated by um, the spatial organization of biochemistry in cells, uh, which involves uh, the assembly of molecules in condensed structures, um, which then motivated us to study the, the physics of um, droplets that are chemically active and their spatial organization. Um, so this work started out um, um, many years ago with Tony Heimann. Uh, we've also collaborated more recently with Stefan Grill. And uh, on the theory side, I'd like to highlight Christoph Weber. And then <clears throat> the students who have participated, in particular, Jonathan Bauermann and a postdoc, Arjun Narayaban, um, played a key role in the, in the work I'm presenting. So that's the outline of my talk. I will first show a brief um, motivation for this work from biology of the, um, the view of the cell, cell cytoplasm as an active emulsion where um, con condensed structures organize chemistry in space. Um, this sort of biological um, background motivates the theoretical study of active droplets that are driven by chemical processes. Um, and um, in the last part, I will look at a experimental system in um, vivo where dynamic um, condensed structures um, occur um, with a very interest, interesting um, and sort of unconventional um, dynamics. So cells um, organize biochemical processes, um, and they have to do that in, a, in, a, in space. They have distinct biochemical compartments with different environments and different um, local properties where um, processes take place in, in confined um, compartmentalized structures. The typical example are organelles which are bounded by membranes, but there are many structures in cells, foci, granules, where the molecules assembly um, in um, structures of variable size that are actually very dynamic, um, um, and they provide local biochemistry that is different from, from elsewhere. And here I show you examples uh, which can be visualized by labeling specific molecules um, and observing the fluorescence um, in the microscopy. Um, they can exist in the nucleus, such as nucleoli, which are these green structures in the red labeled nuclei. These are also nuclear bodies here in green. The system we have, uh, these are examples in the, in the cytoplasm, such as uh, so-called stress granules that are formed when cells are exposed to unpleasant conditions, such as toxicity or heat. Um, and the system we have somehow most intensely studied are these so-called P granules, which are here labeled in green, which come in many different sizes and show that we have an emulsion inside this cytoplasm of this, of this cell. In the last part of my talk, I will talk about these cortical condensates, um, which are associated with the formation of the cell cortex um, and involve actin. So here you see these P granules um, in a cell that is about to divide asymmetrically. And um, the dynamics of these um, condensates, of these, as we'll show you, droplets, is used to spatially segregate the cytoplasm um, during asymmetric cell division to generate two cells of different composition and different fate and properties. Now, in this case, one can show that the segregation does not occur as one might superficially 
um, assume by flows, but rather by assembly, disassembly, kinetics of these structures. And these um, peak granules are um, very dynamic, but they also have liquid-like properties. So they um, can fuse um, here the material uh, um, of peak granules shown fluorescently wetting nuclei of an adult worm and under shear they deform as one would expect from a liquid with some surface tension. So one can estimate surface tension, viscosities and similar properties of liquid-like droplets. So the picture is that we have an assembly um, of molecules in a multi-component system um, similar to phase separation in, in, in physics. And um, temperature actually can play a role as a control parameter of these structures. Um, so here you see an example where temperature is raised from 15 to 27 degrees. The low constant temperature is as control. Um, and under increased temperature, these structures dissolve. Um, and this process is reversible. So reducing the temperature again um, leads to the, the regrowth and reformation of these structures. In this case, you also see that after they form again, they have this segregated organization. So this provides a picture um, that the cell uses formation of um, phase separated condensed structures of molecules to, pro to generate um, localized compartments of a distinct composition which is different from the surroundings. Um, this can be used to localize biochemical processes. One can think of such droplets as microreactors, um, which localize chemistry. But one can also think of chemical processes regulating the dynamics of these structures. Um, <clears throat> and of course, sort of the feedback that these structures organize chemistry. So this led us to um, investigate the interplay of phase separation with chemical processes um, with the interest to go towards non-equilibrium states as motivated by, by cell um, biology. <clears throat> so this brings me to the active droplets driven by uh, chemical processes. So these are the main people involved in what I'm going to present. So we start out um, from a thermodynamic description of a multi-component liquid that can undergo phase separation and therefore form an emulsion. So starting from a sort of local thermodynamics, a local free energy can define chemical potentials. We then have something like a kahn hilliard equation um, to describe the dynamics of components in space and time. And in the presence of chemical reactions, there are source terms because the individual um, molecular components are not conserved. Now we have to complement this with chemistry. Um, if one has a very general set of chemical reactions um, coupling all these components, this defines the stoichiometric coefficients as a matrix. So alpha is a reaction index, K is a component index. And they can be on the left and right side of such a reaction. The R alphas are the reaction fluxes of a given reaction. And <clears throat> from there we can then define the reaction Gibbs free energy for each, each reaction using the stoichiometric matrix and the chemical potentials. And the sources are then similarly um, generated by the reaction fluxes via the stoichiometric matrix. Um, now, chemical equilibrium corresponds to this delta mu alpha equals zero. And phase equilibrium means that we have states of two different composition with equal chemical potentials in the two phases. If you go out of equilibrium, um, local Reversibility implies that such detail balance conditions for the ratio of forward and backward rates um, of the chemistry. Now, it's interesting to discuss um, how the classical mass action kinetics of chemical reactions looks like when we have an emulsion, if you have phase separation. And an elegant way to discuss that is um, to use a representation that chemists like and we use these activity coefficients when representing the chemical potential. Now, in general, from an arbitrary interacting system, these are functions of composition. Um, but in simple cases, such as dilute limits, they may be considered constants. And if these gamma k's become constants, then um, the equilibrium constant of the reaction takes sort of a, a simple form. 
um, um, and can be expressed in terms of these coefficients. Now, when we go to an emulsion where we have different phases, the gammas can no longer be constants. It's, um, but it's, one can keep the simple picture by assigning sort of the coexisting phases constant values which are different in the two phases. So that amounts to taking a reference composition and small variations around it, and at these reference coefficients, these values are, are given. And now we have a situation where um, you have a phase equilibrium, which is a, defines the ratio of concentrations across the phase boundary, given by ratios of these coefficients, um, and the equilibrium constants can also be expressed in terms of them, which implies we have two different equilibrium constants in the two different phases if you have phase coexistence. That's sort of the difference to the simple classical um, mass action kinetics. Now, um, because both depend only on these activity coefficients, one has a relationship between these partition coefficients, defined as the ratios of concentrations, and the reaction constants. Right? These are these stoichiometric coefficients. And this uh, relationship, which follows from the consistency of equilibria in chemistry and, and phase separation, can be illustrated as follows. If you take a phase diagram, in this case a ternary phase diagram with a by nodal and high lines connecting coexisting compositions. Um, and we now add a chemical process, and this orange line in this picture would be the chemical equilibrium, where delta mu is zero. Then the chemical and phase equilibrium must be consistent, which implies that these lines at the, at the points connected by a tie line must be both at chemical and phase equilibrium. Now, we can drive such a system out of equilibrium by providing some fuel via some chemostats and having coupling it to an external um, delta mu, which cannot relax to zero. Um, and then this has to be taken into account in the detailed balance condition for the chemical rates. But it doesn't involve the phase equilibrium, and therefore we can break the consistency between phase and chemical equilibrium. So we can go from some, this passive state to such an active case where, for example, here the um, coexistence of two phases at an interface would not be consistent with chemical equilibrium, and the system is then fundamentally out of equilibrium, will not relax to an equilibrium state. <clears throat> now, one can use such non-equilibrium droplet systems to study interesting phenomena. And the first thing to note is that if we take the simplest sort of binary system, um, which turns over A to B, B phase separates from A, described by such a hahn hillard equation with some, some um, source term, and that's the typical form that we're using for the source is shown here, um, that keeps the system out of equilibrium. This typically generates droplets of a well-defined size, which turns over, and then can think of this as now a microreactor that turns over material instead of a, in, in a metabolism-like process. So one can, this sort of mimics a, a, as a simple physical system, a cell which turns over material uh, out of equilibrium and has a well-defined size and shape. Now we think of this also as, an, as, a, as a sort of the minimal system for cell-like structures out of equilibrium. And uh, it's intriguing that these systems can show properties such as division. So they can become unstable with respect to their shape and, and, and split in two and divide. Um, and it's exactly the simple model I just showed you, which does that. Um, and after division, it's typically smaller than before, um, is stable in terms of the shape, goes to a sphere, grows again, becomes unstable and divides. So we get, get rounds of, um, of growth and division very similar to, to a cellular system. Now, uh, this is a very primitive system. If you want to build something like a minimal physical model of a cell-like structure, which we think of as a protocell, uh, we can add a few components. We can distinguish the nutrient from the droplet itself, and, and the droplet can turn to a waste. We also have some solvent in the background. Um, so we can think of feeding the system with nutrient, taking out waste, and keeping it out of equilibrium this way, and we can drive it in different ways. Uh, as we described so far, we can, can drive it with some fuel in the bulk that I break some of this consistency between um, 
phase coexistence and reactions in the bulk. I can also keep inside my volume microreversibility intact and feed everything only via the boundary conditions. So coupling it to chemostats of nutrient and waste by keeping the chemical potentials different, the system is maintained out of equilibrium, but inside the box, there is nothing that breaks detail balance. And that's sort of similar to how an organism or a cell would ma be maintained out of equilibrium by exchanging nutrients and waste and feed with the outside. Now here's an example by such a system with um, driving at the boundaries um, is shown. It's a, it's a multi-component system and it can show all these features that I described in a simple model, such as this type of photocell division. Now, doing numerical calculations in these three-dimensional boxes is um, very costly, and it would, it would be nice to have a two-dimensional model um, for this problem, uh, where we can, can look at sort of ecosystems of little cell-like uh, droplets that, that evolve together. But one difficulty is that in two dimensions, this division process is, um, yeah, is more difficult to occur because in three dimensions it is facilitated by the radio instability of these short necks that form after the shape instability. So this leads to a sort of narrow cylinder-like geometry which then becomes unstable. In two dimensions, these narrow structures are not unstable and therefore splitting these structures is, uh, is, is um, not so obvious. And in fact, if you take the same model, um, in two dimensions and they run through this instability, it does not divide, it creates patterns. Okay. Um, and that's exactly a consequence of narrow structures being, being stable. Now, in order to build a model that divides, um, we added a twist in two dimensions, we added um, surface reactions. So the idea is to have curvature dependent reactions at the interface, um, and that helps div dividing these cells. So to get the curvature at the interface, first we have a term that's proportional to the gradient of phi, in this case of fourth power, could, <clears throat> which is f different from zero only in the interface. And this is proportional to the mean curvature of the interface, which can be calculated as the version of the normal. And the normal is something like grad phi normalized. And because this has a one over grad phi squared, we need a fourth power here to make everything sort of regular in, in the numerics. Now this divides nicely and can run efficiently and quickly um, and generate somehow a growing population of these little protocells in, the, in this box. So here I show you the same system, now changing the strength of this value k starting from situation where the system is actually stable and then K helps to destabilize it. Weak values, it doesn't split yet, it generates these extending lines. And if K is large enough, it grows little colonies at different, at different rates. So this allows us to build two-dimensional models of many of these um, cell-like droplets. Um, and this also um, motivated us to investigate more the role of these curvature-dependent surface reactions, which we would expect in general, and also in the biological context, there may be many situations where reactions actually are localized to interfaces. And it, this may not only be membranes, this can also be uh, surfaces of such condensed structures. Um, and then um, it's also natural to have a dependence on curvature, as this is sort of in principle allowed. It's not so clear how strong these effects are, but it's something to think about. So I'm looking here at the minimal system. I'm now removing all the bulk reactions and on, look only at the surface reactions. Let's just show you here um, for brevity, the simple case where there's no sort of spontaneous curvature term, but it's only, only the curvature itself. And here you see now examples for different strength of this, of this um, driving. Of course, first the droplet grows because it's curved at the boundary and you have a, have a source there. Um, and then um, different things happen. Um, and interestingly, the system tends to settle into lattices. Um, in this case, a triangle lattice. In this case, it becomes a square lattice. And this has to do with the fact that this has stationary states when the curvature is zero. So this wants to create 
flat interfaces. And these are examples where this is reached, and this is a limit cycle which doesn't reach these flat interfaces. Now the reason that we have this lattice comes from the fact that the flat interface is only stable over short distances. There is a maximal length beyond which we have an instability uh, for a small few, and that settles then in these lattice-like solutions. And here you see sort of an ensemble of, of simulations of the same model at different values of k. So it, it generates triangle lattices, it generates square lattices. It also generates um, chaotic states we don't settle into any steady state. So it's disordered lattices. And it's sort of yeah, interesting to see that with this simple model one can generate structures that are usually not expected for, for droplets. <clears throat> okay, so in the last minutes, um, I'd like to quickly talk about these cortical condensates. So let's now switch gears. Let's look at a biological cell, a living cell, that forms this actomyosin cortex near the cell membrane. But before it performs this cortex, it doesn't have a proper cortex. And the assembly of the cortex involves an intermediate state where many small assemblies form and contain actin, filaments, WASP, ARP23, a set of molecules that are involved in the, in the um, cell biology of the cell cortex. And if you look in the movie, you see that these structures, they come and go. They're very dynamic. They appear, grow, shrink, disappear. And these are the condensates I'm going to describe in the last minutes. So if we track a single condensate, these in the microscope, with two labels, so green and, and, and purple, um, purple for actin, green for wasp, one can see first wasp is assembled, was for a maximum, and then it's disassembled, and actin follows. We can also follow the volume and measure their actual size, um, and so they grow and they shrink afterwards. What I call stoichiometry here is the relative abundance of actin and wasp. Um, now the volume can be measured and it can be correlated to the concentrations of wasp and actin. And essentially it, it grows with the assembly of actin and wasp. So when that's what suggests us as behaves like a phase. It can grow and shrink as molecules are added and removed. And there's something like a typical molecule per volume per molecule. Um, <clears throat> And that's why we think of them as a, as a condensate phase that grow, grows and shrinks as they are as assembled. Now tracking a single condensate, we can look at such traces in two dimensions. They start from zero, they grow and shrink, and if they grow, first grow in wasp, and then they shrink when, when there's more actin. And then taking many of these trajectories, um, we find this flow diagram, which can be measured quite precisely. Each individual trajectory is very um, stochastic, but the ensemble is, is very clean in terms of its dynamics. And one can infer from these flow fields the dynamic rules of the assembly of these condensates. Um, in particular, when we plot the rate of change of actin or the rate of change of wasp versus the volume fractions, um, these are such as linear behaviors. So the data points are a bit spread out, but they're really well described as linear curves. And this then suggests these dynamic equations that are respond to these linear behaviors. Um, and one can interpret them in terms of sort of a sort of diagram that somehow the wasp triggers polymerization, the F actin depolymerizes, polymerizes. this would be um, this is self recruitment of wasp, that's the depolymerization of actin, then these coupling terms where the um, actin inhibits the recruitment or removes the wasp from the system and the um, was triggers the polymerization and assembly of the actin. And here the volume is following to the simple rule, which then means we get this flow diagram, which we can plot and compare to the data, and we can measure all these four coefficients using these linear relationships I showed you before. Now, the red and green straight lines here are the null clines. The, the, one, the red one for the actin dynamics, the green one for the was the dynamics, we have a situation where we have a fixed point at zero, zero, which has an unstable and a stable direction. System leaves in the unstable direction, makes this loop and enters back here from the, from the stable direction. Um, now time is almost out, so I skip over this here. Maybe just a brief 
um, comment here. If I use these concentration variables, this looks like a mass action dynamics, but it's, it's um, different and that is also couples to the volume. So we have an equation for the composition and the volume change depends itself on composition and here these curves show how the thing grows and shrinks. So we have very unconventional dynamic condensates, um, volume dynamics driven by chemical reates. Um, somehow the fact that we have a phase that grows and shrinks and we have mass action kinetics suggests that these are, um, one can think of them as, 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 as dynamic phases, maybe liquid-like phases that do this dynamics. Um, by perturbing the system, one can, can switch from the state I've des described you so far to a state where um, when, when, when goes from this bounded growth to unbounded growth, that's very similar. Um, so say from this scenario, by flipping these two null clients to an unbounded scenario, which is very similar to the transition between bounded and unbounded growth of microtubules. And we think that this, <coughs> this system um, somehow generates small structures of well-defined composition that controls the assembly of actin without it, it running out of control because it's an autocatalytic process that needs to be uh, somehow tamed. And that's what these condensates do. Um, and with that, um, I thank you for your attention. I'll stop here. Any questions? See, the third part uh, in the action cortex uh, phase separation dynamics that you are describing, is there any role of Oswald ripening? I mean, uh, two droplets, can they, do they coalesce or they simply grow and uh, come back? So without chemical reactions, you would have Oswald ripening. If you switch on chemical reactions, you can suppress it and you get, get droplets of fixed size. Bigger droplets would shrink, smaller droplets would grow, and you can, it stalls Oswald ripening. Okay. And the Oswald ripening can change this uh, sort of, this, this dynamical process fundamentally, right? I mean... Which process? The, this, uh, this time, this... Circuit. The last one. The, yeah. The, so here we don't see any, the dynamics is very different. It's really driven by chemistry, as, as I described. It's, it's the droplet dynamics fully governed by, by the chemical dynamics. And the size is controlled mainly by the reaction rates? Yes, and this, this, the sizes follow from this, from this um, dynamic loops, yeah. Mm -hmm. They have to do with... But in, in two dimensions, it seems to also depend on your surface uh, curvature dependent, even when you have the reaction rates, I think. Are you talking about the second part or the first part? Um, um, sec when you talk about yeah. two dimensions, the first part. Um, yeah, in, I think the size control is independent of dimension. The dimensionality more determines the nonlinear process when you when you Same. change the shape and when okay. you what type of patterns you get mm -hmm. when surface become unstable. Okay. Any other questions? So, um, Frank and Mike here. So, uh, sorry, can I go ahead and ask? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I had two questions. One one was uh, about the first part, the p the p granules. Um, so, when you raise the temperature and bring, and so the, the granules disappear. Uh, and then when you bring them back, would they already have exhibited phase, uh, the um, uh, segregation or, or do they have to undergo this cycle of segregation again? So the segregation happens with differential assembly, disassembly. And if right. you dissolve them, then they disappear. And if you, re, um, if you bring them back up again, they only assemble on the one side. And that's why you see them then only on one side. So they, they, they are already segregated when you bring them back. Uh, or they bring are brought back in a segregated or they, or state they, because the idea is that they this grow come only back. On, the, on the posterior side where the conditions are I see. the right I see. ones for them to be assembled. On the other side, they are not being they, assembled. They, okay. Be, okay. And, 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 and in a normal process, they would be disassembled first on, the, on one right. side. Right. right. And, and, the, um, and, the, and the second question was about the actin uh, um, clusters. So, so how does the actin cluster feed back on the disassembly of the, of the granule itself? Um, that's what you're proposing. Yes, the, yes. The, There's a feedback both ways. That the actin um, well, the wasp would has a negative um, effect on, 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 on the wasp, but the, but the wasp promotes the actin. Yeah? And the actin disassembles the wasp, but that's by some mechanical me means or... Do we know that? We or, think of it as a biochemical process. I, I, we don't know the molecular details. It, it looks very much like a chemically driven event. I see. But what, I, I, of course, I, I'm 
not looking at the details here, so there are filaments of actin which also polymerize. There is ARP23, which involves, so it's a, it's a quite complex bio, biochemical module which effectively has these properties. Okay, we have several more questions. Great talk, Frank. Um, I wonder, because now you have a, um, a more realistic model for the cell division with boundary driving and keeping in track of the waste and so on, do you have experimental systems in mind where you could possibly see the cell division um, uh, in, in experiments? Do you have a...? Yeah, there are different, I think, different ideas of how to build such systems um, synthetically. Um, in particular, uh, Job Birkhoven in Munich has an interesting system um, of uh, synthetic molecules which can react with water, which can phase separate from water, and, and, and where you can mimic many of these features. But I just don't think he has yet um, produced these, these exact conditions. But I think there are examples of systems which should, should be able to realize that. And maybe one can also do it with purified biomolecules, would be another, another way to think about it. And uh, so last question. So the, what is the steady state of this di dividing uh, droplets? Do they go to this selected? Um, size and stop there, or do they continue? What do they do once they fill the size, system size? So, so when, when the system has filled the box, then you are in this steady state of many droplets with arrested oscillate driving. So they are all just turning over internally and having little concentration gradients around them, but they are stationary. But they have, don't have space to, to grow and divide anymore. Um, and somehow they're hampered by their neighbors to, to do it. And if they have a free space on one side, then, then they're somehow moving in that space and dividing. Just, um, you talk about this difficulty to break up in two dimensions and the role of rail instability. So I was wondering uh, if you think that then, what was the role of hydrodynamics? Because you have a liquid medium and that can contribute also to the breakup of the droplets uh, instead of these uh, surface reactions. That's a good question. So we looked at the hydrodynamics in three dimensions and it modulates a bit the, the process because Flows cannot be ignored because you have pressure gradients in the, in the system and it deforms from a sphere, then you can take the flows into account. Um, we haven't done that in two dimensions. Good, good question, we should check whether it helps. 